This video focuses on step three of the four-step travel demand process uh, mode choice. And after today's lecture, students have to this point learned about the first two steps in the traditional travel demand model, trip generation and trip distribution. And so once we know how many trips are going between one zone and another, the next step is to determine how many of those trips are going to utilize each of the available modes. So after today's lecture, students should be able to describe the factors that influence this mode choice decision. They should be able to determine which models may be appropriate given availability of data. And then they should be able to estimate mode share among the competing modes using a variety of commonly applied methods. And so when we talk about mode choice, as I had alluded to, we generally at this point in the process know how many trips are starting and ending in each zone and how many trips are going from one zone to another. And so the next step from a planning context is determining what percentage of these trips are going to use automobile versus transit options that may be available. And so when we try to develop models for this mode choice decision, there's a few factors that are going to determine which modes will be selected. And the first and most obvious is what sort of transit services are actually available. So in smaller, more suburban communities and rural communities, we obviously aren't going to have light rail transit systems or anything of that nature, but we would likely have bus services, for example. And the decision as to whether or not to use a bus service versus personal automobile versus carpooling can be related back to a series of individual or household characteristics that describe those travelers. So for example, we tend to see that lower income families are generally constrained such that they may not be able to afford an automobile and may be uh, forced to become what we refer to as captive transit riders. Uh, we use the term captive because they wouldn't really have another alternative. Another characteristic we can use to predict travel behavior is how many automobiles are owned by a specific household. Obviously, the more automobiles you have, the more likely you would be to use that versus available transit modes. And then once we've made determinations about the transit systems, the choice of whether to use transit or an automobile mode would relate back to measurable characteristics about those systems, like the travel time associated in getting from point A to point B, the actual monetary cost, and then to some level, comfort and convenience are also going to play a role in this decision. And so ultimately, uh, the text outlines four general types of travel demand models that are used to model this mode choice decision and estimate what percentage of traffic is going to use automobile versus whatever transit options are available. And so these four methods, which we'll get to in the subsequent slides, are direct generation models, trip end models, trip interchange models, and logit models. And so starting with direct generation models, what direct generation models do is they allow you to estimate modal trips based upon population density. So these are essentially relatively simplistic models that we can apply broadly on a community. And what we see from these models is as our population becomes denser, so as we move from rural Iowa, for example, to New York City, given the increase in population density, we're going to, of course, expect to see significant increases in transit ridership in that more urbanized environment as well. Now, in this simple model, attributes of the actual transit system or potential modes are not considered. So regardless of what travel time, cost, convenience are, these are just large scale models that were developed based on different transit utilization at a very high level of aggregation. So if you compare communities with different population densities and then estimate a regression model essentially to see how much of that community would use transit given simply population density. And so we'll just demonstrate a real quick example. Let's say well, we have a zone that's generating trips uh, where we have 5,000 people living across 50 acres. And we know that within this zone, in these 5,000 people, 40% of these households have no automobiles, and 60% of these households have one automobile. So you would suspect this is more of an urbanized community. And so the way we utilize the direct generation model, this is simply based on a series of simple equations, which are presented here in graphical form. We're relating the number of transit trips per day as a percentage of the total population basically and so what we need to do here we're looking at population density on the x-axis we see what the density is in persons per acre and then we see different transit utilization rates for households with no automobiles versus one automobile and as you would expect a household that doesn't have any automobiles is going to make a larger number of transit trips than we would see in a one auto household and so just utilizing this equation in this graphic here, what we see, we can calculate the population density. We've got 5,000 people for 50 acres. 
100 persons per acre and then from this we can directly determine that we would expect to see on average 510 transit trips per day among the zero automobile households and 250 trips per day from the one automobile household that would utilize transit and so ultimately our figure we're just summing these and we end up then with a total of 510 trips per day for thousand population for the zeros 250 for the one auto households and we were given previously that 40 percent of this study area had zero autos, 60 percent had one auto and we also have information about the population in thousands here and so from this we simply take these rates and 40 percent of the households times 5,000 population times 510 trips and then likewise for the one auto household 60 percent of the sample of 5,000 individuals 250 trips on average per thousand people and we end up with 1,770 transit trips per day as the final solution continuing on the second model the trip n model is illustrated here so what we're doing in the trip n model is we're determining prior to trip distribution how many trips are going to be made by each mode so essentially this goes back to step one the trip generation step and so under the trip end model we would actually provide separate estimates for the number of trips that would be generated by auto and by transit and so in determining these estimates what we do is we make our allocation based on land use characteristics and population density that we talked about with the previous method and we can also relate this back to socioeconomic characteristics such as auto ownership income so forth and so on uh, the trip end model does not incorporate quality of service so that's something that's that's left out here but we are able to capture different nuances within the travel community and so what we're doing in the trip end procedure first of all we're determining trip attractions and productions by purpose and then we're determining an urban travel factor so depending upon how urbanized an area is we are then going to be able to compute this urban travel factor which will then allow us to estimate the percentage of trips that are going to use transit versus other modes using a mode choice curve once we know how many trips are going to use each of the modes we can apply an auto occupancy factor so let's say if we have 1.4 persons per automobile we can then back calculate to determine how many total vehicle trips would result as a part of that and then when we get the trip distribution we would actually determine the auto and transit trip distribution steps separately so this is slightly different from the traditional four-step travel demand model where we're actually breaking these out and applying separate models for each of the available modes. And so as one example, all we're doing right here, let's say we want to determine the percentage of residents who are going to use transit in a zone that has 1.8 households per automobile and a residential density of 15,000 persons per square mile. And so on that basis, we're basically calculating this urban travel factor, which is just simply a relationship between auto ownership and population density and as you would expect as this urban travel factor gets larger which means as we have a fewer number of automobiles per household or we have a higher population density we're going to expect a larger percentage of people are actually going to use transit in that context and so we can directly calculate the urban travel factor we know that we have 1.8 automobiles per household we know that we have 15,000 persons per square mile and so our urban travel factor then in this example is going to be equal to 27 and so we simply go to this graphic and we can see that if we've got an urban travel factor of 27 we would expect roughly 45 percent share for transit so we could use that 45 percent number then to go back and determine what total number of trips are going to utilize transit in this community and so that's the trip end model the trip interchange model is builds upon a slightly more complex model because this is actually able to incorporate system level of service variables and what we mean by level of service variables are different factors that we can use to quantify how good the level of services that's provided by a transit option for example and so the types of variables we would consider there in vehicle travel time so how long it actually takes you to get from your origin to your destination uh, excess time which refers to everything exclusive of the in-vehicle travel time so if you're taking time walking to a bus stop if you're waiting at a bus stop for the bus to arrive these are examples of excess times travel costs for transit systems this would be the cost of fare ridership or monthly passes for use of a system for automobiles we'd be looking at costs like fuel and parking and long-term maintenance of the vehicle 
And then also we would expect differences based on the economic status of the trip maker. So persons with higher income may be more conducive to taking a specific transit mode, even if it's more expensive, or driving an automobile if it's more expensive, because they have the discretionary income to do so. And so what we're doing with the trip interchange model is we're essentially calculating what's referred to as an impedance factor. And so what an impedance factor is doing is it's taking that in-vehicle travel time we have, it's taking the excess time, so the walking and waiting time, and then it's also taking the cost of that trip, and collectively it's adding those together and it's converting everything into terms of minutes essentially. So we're assuming based on the model you see right here that the time people spend walking and waiting for a transit vehicle, they tend to overestimate how much time that actually takes and so what this two and a half here says is that people are two and a half times more sensitive to that waiting time so they'd much prefer to spend that time in the vehicle and they're willing to pay a larger premium for that um, in the case of trip costs what was developed here as a part of this method is you can take the actual dollar value cost of that trip and then scale it by the income of the individual and so what this allows us to do then is account for the fact that higher income individuals are able and willing to pay more for travel that lower income travelers would not be able to. And so when we're trying to calculate mode shares right here, it's somewhat interesting. The way this works, if you look at the impedance, so impedance is essentially measuring how much travel time is associated with the mode. And travel time in this case is bad. We'd like to minimize that quantity. And so to calculate the mode share for automobile, we're actually taking the ratio of the impedance factor for transit, the competing mode, over the sum of the impedance factors for auto and the other transit alternative. Likewise, for transit, we're taking the ratio of the impedance factor for the competing mode auto over the transit and auto impedance factors. And of course, you can simply get from one to the other because these are complementary functions and will sum to 100%. So you can choose to calculate one and then back calculate the other. Now when we look at the form of this equation, B here is essentially an exponent which reflects how sensitive people are to travel times within that specific community and all other variables are as defined right here. And so if we look at this equation, you notice as I just alluded to, it's an inverse relationship here and so as the impedance of one mode increases as it becomes less desirable, it's going to tend to shift people toward that other mode. The easiest way to demonstrate this is through a nice simple example. So let's look at the sample data that's provided here for auto and transit. And let's say we're trying to determine how many trips are going to utilize transit between a suburban area and a downtown area. We're given that the exponent value, so the B from the preceding equations is equal to 2.0. We're told that the median income in this community is $24,000. And then based on this, we want to determine the expected percentages of auto and transit. We're provided details here. We see that auto trips generally are slightly longer than the transit trips. They're also slightly more expensive. And unsurprisingly, we see larger excess time walking and waiting for transit. Automobile has parking costs associated with it and also tends to provide slightly better service, i.e. higher travel speeds. And so what we're doing is we're trying to convert all of these quantities into consistent units, which in our case are going to be minutes, equivalent minutes. And so, for example, we can take that 30 mile per hour travel time over the 10 mile trip distance to estimate the total amount of time that a traveler is going to spend in the automobile for both auto and transit, which had the 20 mile per hour average speed and the 8 mile trip length. Excess time is then computed and scaled by a factor of 2.5 because travelers tend to be much more sensitive to excess time. They don't like waiting. And lastly, we take the cost of this trip and simply scale that by income, which is then converted to an equivalent number of minutes based upon this median income value. And so what we see from this is that the impedance value for auto is 66.25 minutes and for transit is 56 minutes. And so on this basis, obviously transit has a lower average travel time, so it's going to tend to be more desirable to travelers in this instance. And so to determine the actual mode share, we simply take the impedance factor for transit. We take it to the second power. This is that exponent that's been calibrated as noted on the previous slide. And so the auto mode share is simply going to be the ratio of the impedance for transit over the sum of the impedance for transit and auto 
And consistent with what we had saw on the previous slide, we're seeing less than half of the travelers are using auto, so 41.7%. And we can that calculate the share for transit is the remaining 58.3%. Obviously, had we shifted this equation and included auto in the numerator, that would have given us that same 58.3% back. And so that ultimately then is our transit mode share between zones S and D. And so the trip interchange model is essentially comparing different alternatives in terms of their equivalent travel times. Uh, a similar procedure is utilizing a logit model or a logistic regression model where we're quantifying the relative value or utility that's going to be provided by different competing modes. So let's say we have a mode M, which could be auto, it could be various transit systems. We can relate that back to different attributes of the system, which could include travel time, waiting time, costs, so forth and so on. And we're estimating a regression model which is going to follow the logistic distribution. And what that means is we can express the probability of a person taking a mode based on probability distributions. And so if you look at this equation right here, what we'll do in logit models, we'll estimate or use a calibrated logistic regression model. So we have coefficients that tell us how sensitive people are to time and cost and so forth. And then we take these utility functions that are estimated and you exponentiate each. And this will give us an estimate of what the percent share is for a particular mode. So in this example, the proportion of persons using automobile is just the exponential of the utility function for auto divided by the sum of the exponential for the utility functions for each available mode. So in this case, we only have two modes, but you could expand this to three, four, five, any other number of modes as well. And so in contrast to what we had seen with the previous model, in this case, as utility goes up, that basically means that that factor is, is better. We're seeing better service from that mode. In contrast to the impedance factors, where large values of impedance are bad, essentially. And so, for example, let's say we're looking at travel between a suburban area and a downtown zone, and people can either utilize personal automobile or public transit. And so what we see, we've got an equation here that's been estimated as a function of total travel time. So this is in-vehicle travel time here. Um, we see a negative sign as travel time goes up with either of these modes, the mode share is going to go down. Likewise with waiting time and also with cost. And what you'll notice right here is we're assuming that people are equally sensitive to travel times and costs across each of these modes. Now that may or may not be the case in practice because we could envision that in a low income area, people may tend to be less sensitive to cost. So maybe this coefficient is smaller and cost doesn't have as large of a function. But the way these equations have been set up, we're assuming that each of these modes result in similar decisions from travelers with respect to these characteristics. And so the primary difference then are these constant terms and what these indicate is that in general in this community people tend to prefer transit so the utility is less negative in this case which means transit will tend to have a larger mode share with all other things being equal and so just as an example here let's assume these are the in vehicle travel times the excess times and the actual in vehicle costs for these two respective modes and so simply plugging these values into the utility function, so our 20 minute travel time, our eight minute excess time, and our $3.20 cost, gives us a utility value of negative 9.7 for auto. Plugging in those similar values for transit, we see the longer travel times is our major determining factor here. So that results in a significantly lower utility value here. So even though people with all things being equal tend to have a preference for transit, they're not willing to pay that larger penalty for this increased travel time essentially. And so what we see in this instance then is the proportion of travelers that are using automobile is 86% and the proportion that are using transit is 14% and that's largely on the basis of those differences in travel times. And so this wraps up the fourth of the mode choice models that we've talked about up to this point and we will get into these in further detail as we get to our in-class lectures.